everyone. Welcome to Indigeneity Conversations. I'm Alexis Bunton, co-host and also co-director of the Bioneers Indigeneity Program, along with Kara Romero. Hi, everyone. Today, we're honored to be sharing an intimate conversation I had with Julian Brave Noisecat, a member of the Canem Lake Band and descendant of the Watt Nation. Julian is a world-renowned journalist who recently won the American Mosaic Journalism Prize for outstanding long-form work that fosters greater understanding of underreported stories. Julian is a prolific and widely published writer, activist, and policy analyst. He's become a highly influential figure in the coverage of environmental justice, indigenous issues, as well as broader political and economic trends and policies. And Julian really is a tour de force. He's currently working on a book titled, We Survived the Night. The book weaves together a reportage on indigenous peoples in the United States and Canada with a personal narrative about his journey as a young man and writer. He is also making a documentary that explores the links between colonization, genocide, and ecocide. It follows Julian as he searches for unmarked graves at the Canadian residential school that his relatives were sent to. Our conversation offers insight into Julian's personal stories that have brought him to where he is today, his philosophies behind the work, and our shared experiences. First, you'll hear Julian's keynote address at the 2021 Bioneers Virtual Conference, and then we move right into our conversation. Here's Julian. Wait, quick up, Julian Brave Noise Cat when squexed. When Kika had a squest what Alexander Roddy as when Keka had a squest what at Archie Noise Cat. So quach mach ken at Statland ken, that's Esken, which deck one, to Oakland, which deck one. Let one poopsman Elliot took to me what echo piscataway uluch. Quick loot ken, the pioneers. To coast me wach as Oloni uluch, what what Alex. Met back eagle can to sequat mahuluch. Been deceived by Chaim can de nequap epochs, what amuch ui as what to me. Good afternoon. I thought it would be most appropriate to start my keynote in my language, sequat machin, which I was lucky enough to learn from my kia, that's my grandmother. She's the oldest person on the Canem Lake Indian Reserve and one of our last remaining fluent speakers. When she was a little girl, a government official called an Indian agent, took her and a bunch of other kids from Canham Lake away from their families on the back of a cattle truck to an Indian residential school called St. Joseph's Mission. There, they were brutalized for speaking their language and taught to hate themselves for being Indian. Earlier this year, 215 unmarked graves of native children, some as young as three, were discovered at the site of the Kamloops Indian Residential School. My Kea earned her nursing degree there. Not long after, 182 hidden burials were identified at a residential school in Cranbrook, British Columbia. Then 751 in Maryville, Saskatchewan. 160 in Penalacket, British Columbia. Across the continent, First Peoples are now searching for the bones of our young ones at the schools that were supposed to civilize us. Over the last four months, I've been journeying back to St. Joseph's Mission in my people's homelands, where they're using ground penetrating radar to find my Kia's friends, cousins, and classmates who never came home. When I was there in August, I interviewed a former Kukbi or chief. He had never publicly spoken about the residential school and his origins, but on camera, he told me that he was the illegitimate child of the priest, the product of kidnap and rape. Even though he was the child of a white father, he was taken to a residential school with all the other native kids. And like all the other little native kids, he was abused. When I was there, he told me we all were. 
After he shared his story, which ran more than three hours, I stepped out of his front door on the Sugarcane Indian Reserve. Ash was falling from the sky. Western Canada, the Western United States, and really the whole world seemed to blaze. This summer, the northwestern part of North America was gripped by a heat dome that set all-time temperature records from Portland, Oregon to Fort Smith in the Northwest Territories. As of mid-August, heat, wind, lightning, and humans sparked over 1,500 wildfires in British Columbia. One small town, Lytton, where I have friends and relations, burned completely to the ground. It's now little more than a grid of concrete foundations and scorched chimneys. The province of British Columbia, like many other jurisdictions, declared a state of emergency. Now, I'm currently working on my first book and a documentary. And in both of those projects, I'm thinking through the convergence of these apocalypses, the genocide of colonization and the echo side of climate change. I'm trying to understand how indigenous peoples have persisted in the face of existential threats because I believe that our survival ought to matter to more people than just ourselves, that it ought to matter to you. I chose to begin my keynote in my language tonight because I wanted to show you that in our words and in our very being, indigenous peoples are refusing to be annihilated. In Sekwet Mokhchin, I said who I am in relation to my kin, to my community, and to the places I come from because those things matter, not just to Indians, but to all people. At this dire juncture, with a pandemic engulfing humanity and the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere climbing to levels not seen in 3.6 million years, we all need to remember who we are, how we are related, where we come from, and how the other than human world to which we are also related gives us life. Allow me to demonstrate. When I introduced myself, I said, my name is Julian Brave Noisecat. And that meant something because Noisecat or Noisecat, as the name was originally pronounced before the missionaries messed it up, it nearly died out. You see at St. Joseph's, the missionaries baptized us with Christian names. Before then, our people carried ancestral names and earned names, what you might know as Indian names and we could take on many in a lifetime. But as they were taking control of the, our lands, the government of Canada and the church said that that would not do. Us Indians could not be plural. We could only be individuals. They said, you Indians need one name so we can keep track of you, so we can confine you on reservations, count your dwindling numbers, and mark our control of your lives. They gave us names in their faith so they could save us from our supposed savagery. When stealing and destroying are called civilizing and enlightening, they can be justified. In fact, they were so good at taking away names that when she died, my great grandmother, Alice Nouise Cat, was the last person to carry her name. Alice raised my father when his own parents, who were all messed up from the residential school, could not. She was a hard worker. He remembers her towing him out on the family trap line in a sled made from an old car hood. They'd check all the traps, pulling frozen beaver and muskrats out of the water so they could sell their fur and feed their family. They didn't have much and hunger was common. But Alice, Alice was generous. One time she found a fresh apple, a hard thing to come by on the res, even today and she saved it for my dad because she knew he loved them. And then one night in 1966, he remembers when she went out looking for her husband, Jacob, who was out drinking in a blizzard and she froze to death. After Alice was gone, there were no noise cats in the whole world until my father married, reclaimed her name and passed it on to me. Remember, who you are. Be true to who you are. There's power in that. 
but also remember that the power of identity is not individual. It's plural. It's collective. The next thing I did when I introduced myself in my language was I put myself in relation to my family and my people. And here, I should acknowledge that praising boomers probably isn't the wisest decision given the general state of things. As young people, we have certainly inherited far too many problems from our elders, climate change included. But that said, I think it's important to remember that we are not alone, that we have relatives, that we are in fact all related and not just us humans. The other than human world shares some of our DNA too. If we remember that, maybe we will recognize that our fates are also interrelated. Over the last five years, my father and I have participated in the tribal canoe journey. It's an annual indigenous gathering on the West Coast where tribal people organized into what are called canoe families get in their ocean going vessels and paddle for days and even weeks across the seas. At the end of those voyages, we converge on a single community for a week long celebration of food, gifts, speeches, dances, and songs. My father wasn't around for most of my childhood. He was struggling with alcoholism and the demons inherited from St. Joseph's and the cycles of poverty, dysfunction, and abuse it unleashed on Canem Lake. But the canoe journeys have brought us back together and they helped us recognize the importance of family. You see, the beautiful thing about the canoe is that it quickly teaches you that if you want to go anywhere, you need other people. You need a family. You need to go together. Pulling alongside dozens of members of canoe families that welcomed us into their vessels with open arms, my father and I have traveled across international borders and hundreds of miles of ocean. We've made countless friends, learned dozens of new songs, and visited many magical places. We've been inspired. And in 2019, we were inspired to bring the canoe journey to Alcatraz Island. That year marked the 50th anniversary of the Alcatraz occupation, a 19 month protest for indigenous self-determination, sovereignty, and treaty rights. I need you to understand how important the Alcatraz occupation was to indigenous peoples. It's like our version of the Montgomery bus boycott. It launched a social movement that changed the hearts and minds of native and non-native people across the country and around the world. Alcatraz made Indians proud to be Indian again, and it transformed federal policy. During the occupation, President Nixon, the, the friggin' Watergate guy, shifted the federal government's policy from an officially stated goal of termination to one of self-determination. Working with our own canoe family, which we called the Occupied Canoe Family, my mother, father, and gr group of friends that included a youth worker and an Alcatraz occupation veteran organized a paddle around Alcatraz Island on Indigenous Peoples Day in 2019. 18 canoes, including some from as far north as Canada, participated. Dozens of media outlets covered the story. A local TV station broadcasts the canoe circumnavigating the island from its traffic helicopter. Our little all-volunteer effort even made it into the New York Times. And for a day, Alcatraz was not seen as the former federal prison, but instead as a symbol of indigenous freedom, the way native people see it. We can do a lot together when we recognize the fact that we need relatives, that we need family. Every time my father and I got out onto the water, we rekindled and deepened our connection to the seas and places that gave us our Salish culture. And in my introduction, I also told you where I come from. Canem Lake, called Tzikeschen in our language, and Oakland, the town by the bay that raised me. I also acknowledge that today I'm speaking to you from Washington, D.C., the homeland of the Piscataway people, and that you all in Marin are on the territory of the Coast Miwok and Ohlone. 
it was a very cosmopolitan land acknowledgement, one that it's in its head splitting multiplicity demonstrated how our synthetic Zoom connected internet reality can dislocate us from a meaningful relationship to the places where we are. I think that's dangerous because if we don't stop to remember and honor the places we come from and rely upon, how can we possibly defend them? Earlier this year, I was asked to write an essay for the Paris Review celebrating the Kiowa author N. Scott Mamaday, who was the first Native American to win the Pulitzer Prize for fiction. While reporting that piece, I discovered that Mamaday actually taught one of the original student leaders of the Alcatraz occupation. Her name was Lenata Warjack, and in 1968, she became the first Native American student at UC Berkeley. Now, although Mamaday never got involved with the Alcatraz occupation or the Native rights movement, Warjack told me that his lectures influenced her profoundly. So in my reading, reporting, and writing, I set out to understand the ethic at the core of his work, the worldview it grew out of, and the movements it continues to influence. Rereading his books, I noted a brief postscript in my 2010 edition of the Pulitzer Prize winning Housemaid of Dawn. It read, both consciously and subconsciously, my writing has been deeply informed by the land with a sense of place. In some important way, place determines who and what we are. I am Tsikaskanem, a person from Canem Lake, a place we call Broken Rock in our language. But I am also a son of Oakland, a visitor in Washington, DC, and now a virtual guest of Bioneers. My connection to those places and others is also an imperative. It demands that I remember, honor, and protect those patches of earth. Now that we are in dialogue and relation, I believe that you are asked to do the same. You might be thinking that I sound exceptionally proud of being Indian, and I'm certainly guilty of that. But this, this is not mere identity politics. What I'm saying, what I'm thinking through in the book I'm writing and the film I'm making is that a broader humanity facing the apocalypse of climate change might have a thing or two to learn from a people who've lived through the near total loss of our own worlds. That indigenous peoples have something important to say if you're willing to give us an audience like you have given me today. That there might be even ways that our humanity and our collective future can be brightened if you have it in your heart to believe that the civilizing mission was wrong, that the St. Joseph's missions of the world had it all backwards, that in fact, in the long run, it's all of you that have something to learn from all of us, that maybe America, Canada, and the so-called civilized world should become just a little bit more indigenous rather than the other way around. The United Nations says that climate change is nothing less than code red for humanity. It is already brutalizing many of the places we come from and rely upon. It is driving us apart, making us forget that we are not just interconnected, but interrelated. We are all kin. And if we're not careful, climate change is going to make us forget who we are animals of remarkable intellect, capable of immense care and compassion, even when grave injustice has laid us low. So my message for you today is simple. Remember who you are. Remember that you have many relatives, human and non-human. And remember that we all come from somewhere and that those places and the place called Earth need us to fight for them. Julian, thank you so much. Your keynote delivery was stunning and heartbreaking, and I listen to every single word that fell from your mouth. So I just wanted to start 
our Q&A by saying thank you for your generosity and your many gifts that you share in this world. I am interviewing you today from Ogopoge, from Santa Fe, the land of the Karis Tewatiwa and Towa speaking peoples, also known as the Northern Pueblos. And in honor of your keynote, my bones are from the Mojave Desert, from the heart of the Mojave Desert along the California side of the Colorado River is where I'm from and am married into Cochiti Pueblo here. And like you, am a fierce defender of our cultural landscapes and believe in the reindigenization of people and the power of place. I feel so grounded after your keynote and loved the flow and the, you know, circular thinking. It really provided this comfortable feeling for me in the way that we speak of things and have an understanding of interconnectedness and interconnectedness of kinship and of place and of where we come from. I wanted to start out by asking you a little bit more, Julian, about where you're from, about who your mom is. I have this deep sense that she must have been a very amazing person or that she is a very amazing person. Can you tell me a little bit about your mom? Yeah, well, firstly, thank you for that really generous response to what I had to say. And it's very difficult for me to talk about my mom in part because I feel like I'm so close to her and have just been so lucky to be surrounded by her love my whole life that it's hard for me to have the kind of distance lends a certain kind of perspective i find as a writer you can't be so far away from something that you can't see it but when you're you know so close to something in the way that i feel so close to my mom i actually have a really hard time writing about and talking about her because like she's just kind of everything to me and i guess i should say that my father is sequet mukhan satlian cuz i said from british columbia canada my mom is actually an Irish Jewish New Yorker uh, and they met in a bar called the Shadow Brook just outside of New York City. It's like I've kind of dreamt this scene up as a you know maybe a scene from a film or a novel before. <laughs> Apparently my dad uh gave her the earrings out of his ears as like, you know, kind of how they got acquainted and she was the bartender at the bar. So she gave him like free drinks for the whole night. <laughs> And, you know, I guess what I would say is that my mother, even though she's non-native, made a lot of very instinctual and purposeful decisions to make sure that as a kid who looks the way I look and is connected to the community that I'm connected from, that I maintained that relationship. So she from a very young age, before my parents actually split up, she would take me down to the Intertribal Friendship House, which is the third oldest urban Indian community center in the country. It's in, on International Boulevard in Oakland, California. I'd go there for drum and dance practice every Thursday night. And then um, very bravely, actually, she uh, started taking me home to my family's res to visit my relatives, to visit my grandparents, my cousins, my aunts, my uncles which, you know, back in the day before Google Maps and everything, like it's a really remote part of the world to get to from California. And she made that effort, despite the fact that she was not blood related to them. But now she is sort of considered an auntie and a, and a sister and a relative to to my family, which I think reflects on the really loving decisions she made for me as a mom, but also I think on the ways that Native people can be very open and loving in the ways that we make and support relatives, you know, like she's fully part of that family and, and community now. And I think that that's a really incredible and beautiful thing and has made it a lot easier for me coming from the kind of 
childhood situation and home where my dad was not in the picture for a lot of my upbringing to maintain something that at the end of the day has become incredibly important to me and sustaining to me in a way that sometimes it's hard to find the words to capture. Well, thank you for your vulnerability. And I often find as I share and the more vulnerable we are with our upbringings that you make me feel less alone and hopefully um, you connect with other young Native people. I hail from a very similar background um, with a single mom and an absent uh, Native father going through all of the things that you described. And I do know your father and love him and love the genius of his artwork. And in getting to know you, love to see the genius inherited and uh, your art form being writing. And I have such a deep respect, as do so many of us, for your giftedness in writing. And was hoping that you would talk a little bit about learning that that was your gift and that that was your art growing up. Can you talk a little bit about your journey to becoming a writer and maybe, you know, when you knew? I'm still not sure if I'm a writer. <laughs> I, I think I need to write at least one book before they let me call myself that. So you brought up my my dad and I, you know, I've, I've had a complicated relationship with my father, but we're good now in part because of the canoe journeys. And, you know, I just think time can can really heal some wounds. And I guess what I would say is that some of my earliest memories growing up were hanging out in his studio, watching him carve, sitting in the back of his purple powwow van, going to all sorts of Indian art shows, you know, Indian art Northwest in Portland and in random places across North America. And I think my dad had designs on making me into like his apprentice or, you know, like there's a, there's a thing in the native art world, especially with like families that make art and dads whose sons also go on to become artists, particularly among carvers, there's like carving families in the Northwest. And I think that that's kind of maybe originally what he thought I was going to become. And then, you know, we obviously didn't end up spending that much time together after I was a certain age. And then the way that I guess I started to fill that void was by trying to read and learn and, and understand you know, through other people's stories, through novels, through history, who my dad was, who this absence in my life was, and who, you know, our people were. I obviously knew that through him and through my relationship to my family, but there was a whole world of literature and artistic interpretation of what it means to be Indigenous out there that opened up to me when I started reading, you know, people like Leslie Marvin Silco and Sherman Alexi, you know, despite how complicated it is for me to say that now, Louis Erdrich, et cetera. I started sort of emulating the way that they wrote short stories. And then I just kind of kept at it. The reality of the media industry did not seem to make writing and journalism to be a sensible economic decision for me, but I just kept doing it. And eventually I stumbled into an idea for a book and I kept getting published. And eventually I was very fortunate to get a, a book contract. And in the process of doing all that, I guess this is sort of a long story, but I started to think about my craft as a writer, my art as a writer in relation to my father's craft as a carver and as a sculptor. And I do nonfiction. And what's interesting about nonfiction in relation to carving and sculpting is that essentially in both art forms, you go out into the world and you gather material. You know, my dad carves wood, right? Like, so he goes and gets his logs and things to carve into, you know, various pieces. And to a large extent, you're limited in both carving and nonfiction writing by the material that you go out 
and gather in the world. You know, as a nonfiction writer, I'm not at liberty to, you know, make things up as they come to be in, in my mind. I have to go out and report them and gather them up. And then I can shape them down into, you know, the art form of the, the piece that I want to make. And so what I've kind of found is that even though I never conceptualized myself as sort of following in my father's footsteps to become the sculptor that he wanted me to become, in a certain way, I actually did end up following him down that road, at least conceptually, and at least in the form of art and writing that I produce. And that that actually has now started to bring us together. So we are now, you know, over 25 years later in a situation where we hang out. I interview him quite a bit for the book I'm working on and talk about our art. He talks about the things that he's writing on and we sort of bat ideas back and forth about things that we could make uh, together. And, you know, at the same time, I get his input on on the pieces that I'm writing. So in a in a way, writing and art has has always been and and is now becoming very clear to me sort of a, a way of reconnecting to and processing my relationship to my father and ultimately has actually kind of made me an artist in a way that's not that different from his life as an artist. Well, you are telling such a powerful story with your art as a native person to another native person the complexity and the difficulty with the things that we have and need to communicate. It's just a joy to read your writing and to listen to you speak. So I can't wait to read your book and know more about your movie that you're making. Can you share a little bit more about both of those things? Yeah, for sure. So my book is called We Survived the Night. The title is derived from the traditional word for good morning in my people's language. It's chokhwinoch, um, and it doesn't actually translate to good morning. It, If you literally translate what it means, it means you made it through the night or you survived the night. So the book sort of is going to begin with a little bit of a reflection on what it must have meant for my people, my ancestors to say that to each other, you know, in the mornings after the children were taken to the residential schools in the mornings after, you know, we learned that our land had been settled and taken from us without any sort of treaty or recompense by colonists. The mornings after, you know, people died in our pit houses by the the dozens, uh, which is something that happened in 1862 and 1863. And then it's sort of, the way that I think about it is that it's a, in our language, we call it l'chaim, which is like a kind of story that is not about the spiritual beings in the spiritual world, which is to say that it's an account of both my sort of family and personal history, as well as of the things that I've gotten to go out and report on in Indian country, in the United States and Canada and a few other places. And essentially what the story of Indigenous peoples in North America is today. So it's divided into three thematic parts. The first is called Apocalypse, and it's about Indigenous peoples as post-apocalyptic peoples, as people who survived the loss and destruction of our worlds. Uh, The second section is called Odyssey, and it's about Indigenous peoples journeying to return to and reclaim and remake our home and homelands. And then the third section is called Trickster, and it's about Indigenous peoples navigating the seams and contradictions between Indigenous worlds and communities and forms of governance and colonial worlds and institutions and politics. The film, it's a documentary and it's following the search for unmarked graves at the residential school, St. Joseph's Mission, uh, that my family was sent to, which is an ongoing search. So I'm, I'm working on that at the same time as I'm, as I'm writing the book. It's such a powerful development this uncovering of what we've known for so long 
that has happened at the residential boarding schools. And I really look forward to the telling from Indigenous perspective in both the book and the film. Just an aside, it was about 15 years ago. Our tribe is known for our funeral rites that they bring in the Chimwevis and the Southern Paiutes to help the spirit go to the other side, as well as to help the bereaved. And we had several singers go along the Salt Song Trail and go and conduct ceremony at Carlisle and at Sherman and at several of the schools here in the United States, you know, where we hold those stories where we know that the children never came home and the stories of desperation of parents looking for their children. And so the Salt Singers gave the children ceremony so that their spirits could be, you know, released and that we could have some sort of closure. You know, it's going to be a very heartbreaking path as we learn and share these stories and, and hopefully find closure in some sort of ceremony and, you know, bring children home. And so self-care is very important, you know, and so I wish you and everyone that is part of this movement, you know, blessings and self-care along your journey and what you're doing is really important. I wanted to talk a little bit about your work as the Vice President of Policy and Strategy at Data for Progress. And can you talk a little bit about transitioning into this work and the importance of data and uh, a little bit more about um, your behind the scenes work in Washington and being a citizen activist? Yeah, well, first, I just want to say that thank you for sharing the story of the Salt Song Trail and the bringing home of the of your people's children. I think that so many different nations and communities are doing that work right now. And it's incredibly heavy, heavy work. Every time I come back from Williams Lake, I have trouble getting out of bed for like two or three days. Yeah. So I just think that it's important to acknowledge and think about take care of ourselves and each other and to support uh, all the people who are going through uh, the process of telling the truth to a broader public who seems to be listening maybe for the first time to a lot of these stories and seeking justice and accountability to the people who did this and trying to restore, you know, a sense of dignity and wholeness and healing to so many families and people who were so deeply harmed. And I mean, it's just, ah, it makes me sick and angry whenever I think about it. So I never really worked full time as a writer until now. My primary career was in the sort of nonprofit activist um, think tank kind of space. So uh, a few years ago, a friend of mine named Sean McElwee invited me to become the first employee at a think tank he was creating called Data for Progress. And at that think tank, I focused on, and still I'm quite focused on climate change policy, climate change policy and public opinion research as well as advocacy for more progressive climate uh, solutions and, and legislative interventions and regulations and those sorts of things. And, you know, it was essentially a startup. And while I was there, we grew from the two of us to yeah. now Data for Progress employs over 20 people, which was a really cool thing to be a part of. I also got, a, got to... Uh, get pretty involved behind the scenes in a number of campaigns that actually did see it seems to have some real world policy impact. I think I was the first, for example, to put out the idea that Deb Holland should be the Secretary of Interior and through a sort of a public relations insider outsider 
online and sort of, you know, advocacy campaign, I guess, uh, we ended up actually winning that push to make her the first ever Native American cabinet secretary. She's obviously now the secretary of interior. Uh, and, you know, the ability to do that was in large part because of my role and my freedom at, a, at, at the think tank that progress. So I'm really, really grateful for that and really grateful for everyone who I worked with, uh, who also played really important roles in helping make that happen. You know, I think essentially data is both a way to understand what's really going on out in the world, right? Like there's a lot of bad data, but if you have, you know, data that's collected in ways that are, you know, sound social science, sound data science, you can get a more accurate representation of, you know, for example, what people actually think about issues like climate change. And then you can use that to inform realistic and pragmatic strategies to actually act on and transform the world as it exists, which is, I think, sort of the role of, of activism and advocacy. But also, I think it's important to understand that like data can be itself be used as a tool, right? So if you have information about, you know, the views of voters or the public on a particular issue that can then persuade, you know, an elected official, a politician, a political party to behave in different ways, you know, that is one way in which you can make democracy actually more responsive and more progressive and active on issues related to climate change. And so working in, in DC and working in the sort of think tank activist advocacy space the last four years, I've learned how all of that actually happens and works and sometimes doesn't work. And in a way, I think it's actually made me better at writing and understanding, you know, things like politics and policy and understanding the ways that political actors actually make decisions and the ways that they might be persuaded to make different and better political decisions, which I think at the end of the day, if you care about a lot of these things, that that is pretty important knowledge and information. I think definitely understanding as much as you can about how to affect change politically. And then, you know, you have that other really sound piece of being able to influence public opinion. And I think that that is a combination of what you're talking about, that solid data and then art. You know, I mean, I'm just such a believer in the power of art. So to be able to combine your art form to influence people and public opinion is really important. And I think I'm saying that for, you know, the young Native people out there that are listening, that I know I come from a, a platform of encouraging, you know, citizen activism, that no person is without power to affect change. Do you want to speak to that a little bit? as well because you know i i just think that you're such a wonderful example of you know making big change as one person i got the opportunity to learn from and work with lots of other people who understood and knew about things in ways that i did not yet especially when i was younger and earlier on in my career and that at the most basic level working together collectively and collaboratively, that's what politics and democracy are. It's about groups of people with ideas and values about how we should govern ourselves, trying to convince as many people in society that that's actually the best, most just, most equitable, most prosperous way to arrange things for the greatest number of people. That world, the political world, can be a very brutal one. It's one where lots of hopes and dreams die in, in sort of the meat grinder of Congress and electoral politics and those sorts of things. But that once in a while, the right people, the right ideas, and the right sort of 
I don't know, I think moral relationship to how we should be relating to each other as humans can come around and the right things can happen. And especially can happen when, you know, we find common ground and figure out ways to work together and figure out ways to convince other people that, you know, we got some good ideas and, and that they ought to throw their lot in with us rather than the, you know, the cynics and the, the bigots and the, you know, the people who would rather see the world burn. And, you know, in the context of climate change, which is essentially the largest collective action problem of them all, right? It implicates not just every American, but every single person in the world and every society in the world in the epic task of reducing emissions and adapting to a warmer planet. I think that that's kind of our only option is to figure out how to make these systems, these democratic systems, as long as they're democratic, by the way, because they might not always be democratic, you know, work in our favor. And so, I, you know, I would encourage any young person who is interested in that part of how society works to just go for it and be willing to learn and to collaborate and work with other people because, you know, we need as many people in this fight as we can get. And I would add to that, that as we foster young leaders to, you know, listen to your keynote and listen to the messaging of understanding Indigenous issues and the way that you beautifully illustrate the connection between the genocide of Indigenous peoples, the first peoples of place, and as that relates and correlates with ecocide. You have to look at that connection and we have to scream it from, you know, the hilltop so that people understand that in order to rebuild and find solutions, you're not going to be able to do that without that spiritual interdependence that Native people have with each other and with their landscapes and with their bioregions. And so thank you, Julian, for you know, sharing with us and for being so generous with me today during this Q&A. Well, I just want to say big thank you very, very much. It's hard to grow up inheriting all the things that we inherit intergenerationally as Native people, but I think it's also really important to remember that there are incredibly powerful, beautiful, and important things that we also inherit. It's not just the that they did to us at the residential schools. There's a lot more there that, you know, is worth learning and fighting for and taking up. I would especially encourage the young Native people who see this to, you know, be part of that long line of, of fighters and, and ancestors who are going to try to bring us back to who we were because it was a beautiful way, I think. Mark Julian, thank you so much. That was a great conversation with Julian, Kara. Keep an eye out for the book and documentary coming out in the next year or so. Again, the book is titled, We Survived the Night. And you can follow Julian on Twitter for more details about the book and documentary, as well as his regular political analysis. And to hear other episodes of Indigeneity Conversations and hear and see more from Julian Brave Noise Cat, visit our podcast page at Bioneers.org. You can find other original Indigenous media content there and learn about the Indigeneity program and our initiatives, including curricula and materials for students and lifelong learners. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Indigeneity Conversations. It's been such a pleasure to share with you today. Many thanks and take care.